No one would have anticipated when the World War II broke out in Europe in the late 1930s that it would reach New Guinea in such a tragic way. The missionaries opted to stay, never dreaming that when the war was over, 50% of the Divine Word and the Holy Spirit missionaries would be dead. Among them were 55 Holy Spirit sisters. We now join them for the unveiling of the memorial plaque at the Mission Cemetery here in Alexis Afen. We are happy to see so many have come to join us in celebrating our hundred years of existence and mission activity in this country. We have come together here on the mission cemetery in Alexishafen, and it might be a strange place to commemorate a centennial. And I would like to give a short explanation. When we planned our centenary and thought of how we could best recapture the past and make it a real Memorial Day, to think of our many sisters who died during the war, this especially came to our mind. And we do not find the graves of many of our sisters who died during the war on this cemetery. And that put us in our mind to erect a memorial stone with all the names of the sisters that died during the war. Now our brothers, the missionary, sis, uh, missionaries of the Society of the Divine Word, expressed too to do the same. And so we have here uh, erected the three memorial plaques that contain all the names of the sisters, brothers, and fathers that died here during the war. And they are altogether 116 names. A commemorative celebration like this is always based on some special event or events with, of the past. Now, since I look like somebody who has connections with history, they have asked me to retell the story of what happened to the two bishops, 25 priests, 38 brothers, and 56 sisters whose names decorate that plaque in the background. Now, as some of us recall, World War II in the Pacific began with the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. The official declaration of war actually came the day later. Now, for the first year after that, nothing much happened here in Papua New Guinea. Then, almost simultaneously, in late December 1942, both Medang and Wewak witnessed the arrival of Japanese troops. What happened in each area was quite different. And from that moment on, connections between the vicariates of Wewak and of Medang were cut off. Each vicariate had its own tragedy, which took place roughly at this time of the year. In both cases, the disastrous events were connected with ships the Akikaze and the Yorishime Maru. In the early evening of the 18th of December, 1942, four Japanese ships slipped 
into the Weebag Harbor during the night with 2,000 troops, ammunition, full fuel, food, trucks, and military equipment were landed near the Virui Mission Beach, if you know Weebag. The newly arrived Japanese troops had orders to move all missionaries who lived within the perimeter of Weewak to the island of Kairiru, because in those days, Kairiru was the Episcopal headquarters, the diocesan headquarters. That's where the bishop lived. At first, they had freedom of movement of the island, but the Japanese shipping losses in the area began to mount dramatically in the next weeks due to intelligence being fed to the Allied forces working out of Leia, out of Nadzab. And this came from the Australian coast watchers who were hidden in the mountains along the Weewak, Boykin, Butte coast, and here also. But the Japanese could only blame the spies they could see. And those were the missionaries. The fact that most of them were German and were therefore technically, diplomatically, allies of the Japanese did not impress the captors. In early March, the Japanese suffered a crushing defeat at sea and in the air over the Bismarck Sea, which happens to be just north of Kairiru. Now, in retaliation, the Naval High Command in Rabaul ordered that all missionaries at Kairiru must be removed. It took no more than a few hours for the group to board the Akikaze. And then it set sail north for Manus Island. It arrived there the next day in the afternoon at 1 p.m. And then it spent about two hours picking up 20 Catholic, Lutheran missionaries and civilians. By 3.30, it was heading for KVA, New Ireland. It arrived there at 8.30 in the morning on the 17th of March, St. Patrick's Day. And it left shortly after 10. But in the meantime, a small boat came to the destroyer with sealed orders from the Naval High Command in Rabaul to dispose, in quotes, to dispose of all internees on board. So, shortly after noon, on that fateful St. Patrick's Day, as the Akikaze had sailed around the tip of New Ireland and it was going off to Rabaul, as soon as they got out of sight of land, out of sight of New Ireland, St. Patrick's Day, preparations were made for the execution of the 62 prisoners on board. The men came first, then the women. Each one, stripped to the underwear, was blindfolded, with hands tied together with wrists, was led to a platform at the rear of the ship, and then strung up by the hands, by a pulley, which was hung out over the back, the stern of the ship. And while they were hanging in the air like this, each one, each was shot by a firing squad of about four or five riflemen, and then dropped, dropped into the swirling wake of the destroyer which was racing ahead at double its cruising speed so that it would drown out the sound of shooting. Three little children were cast into the sea alive. 
The execution went on for three hours. How do we know all this? The Akikaze was later torpedoed, and a survivor, Lieutenant Kai, testified to all that had happened at a war crimes trial in Yokohama after the war. It was only then, after three years or so, that the SPD and the SSPS were to learn the news of what happened to these Sepik missionaries. Nobody knew, no one. The Medang Bicariot missionaries at this time were slowly gathering here at Alexis Hafen, completely unaware, as I said, of what had happened in the Weevac Bicariot. Then in November, orders came that they had to move to Manam, Manam Island. So they walked down here from the bush, in through here, down to the wharf, and they boarded an old Japanese fishing barge. And it chugged its way up the coast until they got the mana. And the Japanese were also collecting all the missionaries, the Lutheran missionaries in this area. So that when they got the mana, all of them, there were about 140 of them. Priests, brothers, sisters, Lutheran missionaries, and mixed race prisoners. For a while in Manam, there was no bombing. But then during December, it became a daily event. Again, fortunately, no lives were lost. In January 1944, all prisoners were ordered off of Manam. They were to be ferried to Wewak, to Kairiru, and then to Hollandia. Hollandia is what we call Jayapura today. After some days of waiting in the mud and the rain at Awar, which is just opposite Manam, the captives boarded the Yorishime Maru on the evening of February the 5th. Now, they presumed that if they were being moved, they were going to be moved on, since this was a, not a warship because of the Maru. They presumed it was a protected hospital ship. But it was anything but. To their dismay, they saw soldiers and anti-aircraft guns on board. That night, they set sail for a wee back with the missionaries covering the whole deck, flying all over the place. The next morning, February the 6th, at 8 a.m., just as they were rounding the corner of Weebeck at Boram, where the Boram airport is now, she rounded the corner to get into the harbor. A formation of 15 American military planes suddenly appeared. And they made a devastating strafing run on the Yorishima. They also did a bombing run, but without success. In the midst of all this excitement, some mixed race children and sisters dared to wave, despite strictest orders from the captain and the crew. On their third run, then, the pilots noticed there was something wrong on the ship. They saw all this white on the ship, and they, they knew there was something different. So they peeled off, and they didn't drop their bombs. They went back home to Nadza. But it was too late. The carnage on deck was an indescribable bloodbath. Those who had died were the fortunate ones. Others were beheaded, maimed, bleeding, groaning, moaning, praying, and dying. Only about 10 were unharmed. Remember, 140? And to this day, 
In the afternoon, sorry, when the ship returned the corner at Weebeck and got into the Weebeck Harbor, the slightly wounded went ashore. And then the badly wounded were laid out on the bare sand in the hot sun. Eventually, someone mercifully put up some canvas to provide shade. The missionaries who could still walk were ordered to bring ashore the bodies of all who had been killed. They were wrapped in blankets and lined up on the sand. Seven priests, 12 brothers, 27 sisters, six Lutheran missionaries, and seven mixed-race civilians. In the afternoon, all the survivors, in whatever condition, had to re-embark. They had had no time to bury the dead. And to this day, no one has ever found out what happened to those remains. Praise and thanksgiving for the missionaries who died in your service. They are our sisters and brothers in the mission work. We are saddened by the sufferings they had to undergo, but it inspires us to continue the work which they could not complete. Their names are embossed in bronze for the world to remember their sacrifice. They had no escape but to surrender their lives to you in the firm hope that you would accept them. With Jesus, they could say, Father, into your hands I place my spirit. As we bless their names, we praise your mysterious wisdom and thank you for receiving them into your home in heaven. In the name of Jesus, for whom they gave their lives, we ask you to bless these plaques which bear their names. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
could have imagined at the end of a Second World War when 50% of the Divine Word missionaries died, among them 55 Holy Spirit sisters, that today we would be here to celebrate and give thanks. At the outbreak of the war, the Australian government provided for overseas persons to leave the country. But the missionaries opted to stay, aware that the gift of consecrated life they had received called them to love God and people without limits. They knew that the call to religious and missionary life included complete self-giving and disposed them to face with greater freedom and readiness even risks to life. <clears throat> and that is what mot motivated those who survived the war to return to Alexishafen. Those sisters who died in the straving of uh, Yorishima Maru, or those who were shot dead on the Japanese destroyer Akikaze and thrown into the sea, as well as those who perished because of lack of proper medical care and food, they did not die in vain. They were like the grain of wheat that needed to die in order to bear abundant fruit. And those sisters who came back and with hope and hard work began the task of rebuilding were like the soil in which the grain of wheat had fallen. There was a kind of communion between those who died and those who survived. Where people commit themselves to one another, where they keep holding on God and where they are willing to be instruments and signs of God, where something divine takes place, people become sources of life. Our presence here today is not only to keep memory of the pioneer sisters who came to this country hundred years ago and to relive past events, but we are here to draw lessons for our present and for the future. The first lesson, we draw it from the unveiling and the blessing of memorial plaques with the names of all the sisters who perished during the war. And it is that we should work for peace and spread the culture of life. As I congratulate you in these centennial celebrations and thank you for the fruitfulness of your apostolate, with the words of John Paul II, I would like to appeal to you with trust. Live to the full your dedication to God so that this world may never be without a ray of divine beauty to lighten the path of human existence. You have set out on a journey of continual conversion of exclusive dedication to the love of God and of your brothers and sisters in order to bear ever more splendid witness to the grace which transfigures Christian life. You know the one in whom you have put your trust. Give him everything. Our contemporaries want to see in consecrated persons the joy which comes from being with the Lord. Sunday. 
when 100 years ago on March 26, our first four sisters arrived in this country. One of them describes their arrival in the following words. A crowd of children from neighboring villages had gathered at the harbor. All were very happy about our arrival. They were not afraid of us. They pressed around us and took us by the hand. And so, accompanied by these little ones, we made our entry here in a manner that reminded us of the Lord's entry into Jerusalem. It is not a coincidence that our centenary celebration, therefore, falls just two days before Palm Sunday. It is a time for rejoicing and marveling God's wonders done through our sisters' presence and service among the Papua New Guinea people. This was the beginning of our missionary presence here. Our sisters found the openness and eagerness of the people, of children and women especially, which made the start easier. Let me speak of what I know best, the impact that lives like theirs have on the women around them. The status of women in any country is based on tradition, what those in power believe women can and should do, and on fact, what our own eyes and common sense tell us what they actually do. The founding mothers of the Holy Spirit mission were not only committed members of a religious order, they were pioneering women who left their homes and their families forever to work in distant and largely unknown places. They first arrived in New Guinea during a period in history when women religious wore wimples, veils, and long habits. The kind of thing that looks so cute in the movies today. <laughs> Pretty, fragile, very feminine, and I expect very hot and inconvenient. Who can forget, having heard it, the World War II story of the five elderly sisters who hiked through the highlands in long habits and veils until an exasperated Danny Leahy ordered them to put on soldiers' trousers. <laughs> the founding mothers may have looked fragile. Their own societies may have said they came from a sex that was weak and incapable but they did come and they did their job. The order's success in New Guinea is an example of what woman power can do. Whatever tradition may say, women are not inferior creatures. They are tough and they are productive. Our families, institutions, and countries, if they expect to thrive, must depend on women for their labor, their managerial talent, and their brains. Suppress their ability to exercise those talents, and our families, institutions, and nations are diminished. We know what the Holy Spirit sisters have done in the past. Today, we honor those who have passed before us. What other wonders the servants of the Holy Spirit will do in the future will depend on the future of women everywhere and the opportunities open to them. to our martyrs in heaven. Thank you to those who returned after the war to turn destruction into vibrant life once again, working until they were granted their reward. Some are buried here. Others are buried in SSPS and SVD cemeteries throughout the country, in other countries and throughout the world. And six lie in our cemetery 
at Holy Spirit Convent in Aspley, Australia. My prayer is that we may prove to be worthy of the challenge that is ours as we are called to continue the same mission. Always, amid and in spite of our human frailties, may we bring it closer to the fulfilment for which the Son of God, in compassion, love and fidelity to the will of the Father, shed his own blood. Amen.